All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for attending the best space, best place. All right. <laughs> so a little bit about me. So my name is Sean. I'm a senior studying human resource management uh, in the school of Shiler. You can find me at multiple clubs, but most notably in IBC. Uh, currently, I'm president of the Entry <clears throat> Business Council, which oversees all Shiler clubs and outside of club, school, whatever. You can find me catching waves or launching kickballs with my friend, Shelby. He's in here today. Um, but enough about me. Let's learn about launching your entrepreneurship career with Hawaii USA FCU CEO, Greg Young. So please come stand up here. <laughs> All right, so I have a little bio real quick. So Greg has a storied career in financial services with nearly 25 years of experience. Prior to joining Hawaii USA, he worked with American Savings Bank since 2007 most recently as Vice President Marketing Product Manager. His educational background includes an MBA from the University of Hawaii Manoa and a degree in sociology from the University of Washington. As a husband and father of two daughters, daughters Greg manages work, family, and volunteering as an assistant coach for Iolani Intermediate Football Program. In 2022, Greg was honored as one of Hawaii Business Magazine's 20 for the next 20. Under his leadership, Hawaii USA has adopted new technologies and leverages data to optimize the member experience, moving the credit union into a more innovative and competitive space. All right. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the, am I up now? Yeah, now you're up. All right, I, I got a, he said to say a few words and then we'll get into our Q&A. So I guess people always ask me, why did or how did you get into banking? And uh, the truth is, I don't know. I don't know how I kind of fell into it. I went to University of Washington. Uh, I worked there for a little while. I started, I don't know, maybe like all of you, a lot of you, I, I graduated. I thought I'm going to be a financial planner. I don't like finance. I was a sociology major. I remember that, right? Let's go to finance. So I got a job as a financial planner in Bellevue, Washington, and I was terrible. I couldn't sell a thing. And so I um, switched roles and I went to the Federal Home Loan Bank of Seattle, which is, if you guys know the Federal Home Loan Bank system, there were 12 of them. Uh, Seattle no longer exists. Got old into Des Moines, but uh, I was there for a couple of years and then I came home. I uh, worked at Bank of Hawaii for a couple of years, four years, got into lending, went to Wells Fargo and then American Savings and had an opportunity to join USA in 2019, right before the pandemic. So October 2019, I, I jumped over first time in the credit union space. And uh, yeah, very different, interesting. And uh, in 2021, 2021, I became the president CEO. Um, I, people ask me if I had that on my list to do. And the truth is no, I didn't. When you would, if you would have asked me in 2019, 2020, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, I would have told you, I still don't know. And I joined the credit union as the head of lending. So I was a lending, uh, the chief lending officer. And about a year into the job, the CEO decided he's going to retire. And uh, I had an opportunity to apply for the job. I just joined the credit union industry and just that company a year prior. So initially, I didn't apply. I didn't put my name in. <clears throat> there were three other, as Stacy knows, there were three other internal candidates. We hired a Texas uh, search firm, executive search firm. And uh, somewhere along the line, they asked me, why don't you apply? Uh, and I, so I said, okay. I would only apply if I thought I could bring something different. If I could do something different, help the credit union. And if I could do that, I would, I would apply. So I went home, talked to my wife. And uh, after talking, I said, okay, maybe I can. So then I had to talk to her about this commitment they would take and with two kids. And so we decided, okay, we can make this happen if it, if it works out. Uh, but again, Texas search firm. Uh, so I applied, uh, it took about nine months, about eight, nine months, long process. And I was chosen. Um, I appreciated the board that chose me because it's very easy. There were a lot of mainland candidates, probably more qualified than I was, uh, but they ended up with a born and raised local, you know, 
local boy. So that was a nice change. Uh, Carl was local, but the trend has been to go mainland. Now, interesting enough, if you look at the banking industry, 10 years ago, all mainland CEOs. Fast forward to now, Bank of Hawaii is Peter Ho, local boy. Um, yeah, America Saves Bank, Anton Ishii, local boy. TBB, Arno Martinez, local. So you start to see a trend where now they're looking at Hawaii born and raised and saying, well, they're just as good as anything we can get anywhere else. Um, obviously, Shiler has a big part of that. So um, I, I, I was very appreciative that the board made that decision. Obviously not because I got the job, but because they, they were willing to take a risk right, on, on the local person. So anyway, that's kind of a quick quick background on myself. You want to get into Q&A? Yeah, let's, okay, let's, let's crack it. into it. There's nothing <laughs> bad. I don't know what he's going to ask me. So. Yeah, he's on the hot seat today, yeah. all right? I'm always on the hot seat. So <laughs> I saw on LinkedIn, you got your MBA in Scheidler yes. and decided to stay in Hawaii. So just tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, <clears throat> so Scheidler, it was amazing. Um, I, I come home, I'm working, member of a sociology major, thinking I'm in finance my whole career. Maybe it's about time I learned some business and some finance. So I went back to UH, I went to their executive MBA program. And in the program, my last, it's a 22 month full time where you work full time. I started in 2005. My daughter was born in November 2005, my first daughter. So probably not the best time to start, but there's never a good time. So I decided to do it. In my last class, at that time, there's a CEO of HI. His name was, um, was, was uh, how can I forget his name? Anyway, he's a CEO of HEI. He, he ended up retiring, and Connie Lau took his spot. And so he came to UH and said, hey, can I help mentor students? So he joined our MBA program. He, he sitting in classrooms for the, our last class, maybe not. And it was a capsule project, and we're doing it. And so I did it on Hoku Scientific. I don't know if you guys, does anybody remember Hoku Scientific? It was a, one of the only Hawaii companies to go public in the last 20 years. Uh, they were a solar company. Actually, they were hydrogen fuel cells way before this movement. And then uh, they changed into solar. They partnered with HEI. So I knew the CEO of, of Hoku. So we did our capsule on their project, on their company. It was a startup in Hawaii. And after doing that, this retired CEO came to me and said, hey, do you want to work at American Savings Bank? Because I, I that, American Savings falls under AGI. So I said, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the ex-retired CEO asked you if you're interested. You say yes. So I said yes. And he had me interview with Connie Lau, which was the incoming CEO. Um, and that's all because of Shadda. Because I took classes here. That local CEO uh, identified me in the classroom and said, hey, why don't you come work for American Savings Bank? So it was pretty cool that that happened. Um, and I graduated in 2007. Mm -hmm. So I did go, to, did we go to Asia for Asia Field Study? Anybody here? No, nobody? Not yet, not yet, right? Not yet. <laughs> Do you have a chance to go to Asia Field Study? I know it's open to the MO first, but they open up to regular too. Um, and if you take, if you get an MBA later, oh, I think it's open to non-ABA, but it's mostly MBA first. If you have a chance, go. We went to, uh, Went to Malaysia, Vietnam, Japan, and China. It was amazing. Pace took us up. Grant Kim? Do we know Grant Kim? Oh, yes. It's the work here. I'm literally done. Wait a minute, he took us. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. Before we talk about more about Elf in the Room, you being CEO, I do want to backtrack a little bit. I heard you played football. So tell us oh, a little bit yeah. more about that. <laughs> yeah. I played football my whole life, but I think what he's referring to is I walked on at the University of Washington, um, Division One football program. It was in '95, so my junior year, so my freshman year, I was supposed to walk on. True story. I went into the coach's office. I'm speaking to him before the season, and I'm all of this size, right? And he looks at me. He's like, "Okay, you're welcome to try out." He's right laughing, and. Uh, at the time, there's this guy, you can look him up. His name is Steve Edman. He went number one in the draft, number one pick. So he walks in while I'm talking to the coach. This guy is 6'4", 300 pounds, all muscle. And I didn't know he was going to be the number one draft pick. And I'm sitting there and I look up at this guy. I'm like, oh, maybe I'm not cut out for this program. 
And uh, of course, as a walk on, you don't get any scholarship. You just you pay your own way, but you 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 can be on the team if you make the team. So I decided I'm not going to try it. I got to put on some bulk and and work out. Uh, <clears throat> so fast forward a couple of years, junior year, and I just forgot about football. And I'm thinking, well, if I graduate, I'm going to regret this for the rest of my life. So my junior year, the football season ends in like January, December, January. Spring starts, so I go off for spring. After now playing for three years, kind of rusty. I guess I showed enough during that spring that when the fall came out, I was asked to come out as a walk-on again. And I did make the team. I didn't get in, so there's no Rudy story here. I didn't get to play. But I did make the team uh, as a senior. We won the Pac-10. It wasn't Pac-12 at the time. It was Pac-10. Won the Pac-10 championship. We're co-Pac-10 with USC. Uh, so I did get a championship ring, so it's pretty cool. Uh, got to suit up for our home games. And uh, I did get to travel to the bowl game. So that's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Are you yeah. in the ring today? No, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was the smallest person on the roster. Okay, yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about football because I played yeah. left guard in high school. So I just oh. want to talk about it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I love football. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, I'm not very knowledgeable in football. I just kind of walked onto the team sophomore year, and I didn't know anything about football. I played left guard because it's the easiest position. You just block the person in front of you. <laughs> not so I'm true. sure you're more experienced. <laughs> true. So I coach intermediate football, Iolani, for 20-something years now. Oh, wow. Um, don't let him fool you guards. Linemen are very important. In fact, uh, one can argue that linemen are the most humble players on the team. They get zero credit. They do all the dirty work. When the team does bad, it's because the linemen are bad. When the team does well, it's because the linemen are doing well. Yet they get zero credit. Who gets the credit? Everybody know Pat, Patrick Mahomes? Yeah, well, so who's the center? Does anybody know who the center is? Never, right? I don't even know who the center is. But everybody knows who Patrick Mahomes is, right? When he does well, it's because of Patrick. But really, without those five people in front of him, he can do what he does. So yeah, don't... don't so your left guard <laughs> experience short. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll break the stereotype on humble linemen. I was best in the league, you know. <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> Sorry to flex that. But anyways, let's get back to the topic. Sure. Um, it was fun on that topic. But um, what is it like to be CEO? I'm sure everyone is thinking that right now in this room. Yeah. So I wasn't prepared for it because I I'd never done it before. Um, <laughs> You think you know what it's about, and you sort of have, have a good idea, but when you're in it, it's very different. A lot of times, so what's interesting is decision making, right? The, the, I'm the final decision maker on a lot of things. But when you're not in that role, and you say I was the chief lending officer, I look up and I think, wow, that decision is a no brainer. You should be doing that. And then I sit in this row, and that same decision is not a no-brainer. It's like, wow, well, what was I thinking? Um, I get those decisions and those questions all day long. And it's hard because I, I can't look at just how it impacts my area. I got to look at how it impacts the entire credit union. So it's very different being in that role. The other thing that's very different is I have to do a lot of work, like these, a lot of talks. So I was just telling Sean that this, this week I have... I think every day I'm, I'm doing some kind of speaking and engagement. Uh, yesterday I spoke to Campbell High School at, at our credit union. Um, on Monday I talked to our credit union. We had this real talk. Uh, yes, well, yesterday I did the Milken Award for the prop, teacher promise for um, Hawaii, and the teacher that won it was from Red Hill Elementary. So I have to present that, say a few words. So that's something that I knew was going to happen, but it's just a lot more than you think. Mm -hmm. um, not my strength, not my strength. Uh, I'm actually an introvert, honestly. I am. I just told my wife last night, wow, this week is very stressing. It's very uh, draining on me. I can do it. I'll do it. I'll do it happily. Um, but it's draining. I, I go home and I'm exhausted. I'm like, wow, that's a lot just for me to speak in front of people. Uh, but I, I, I obviously would love to do it for you guys because I'm a huge guy. Mm -hmm. So proud you, Chad. Um, but yeah, that's kind of work I do. It's very different. A lot of big decision. Um, I signed an invoice the other day for a million dollars. I was like, why did I sign this? Like, who signed this? <laughs> right? So it, things like that. It's very different. Things that you think when you're in the role, it's very different. Um, 
One thing I swore that I would not play was this whole politics game. I don't like politics. I don't like drama. I don't like, but it's hard not to think of it when you're in that role. So and so knows so and so. Okay, yeah. No. What do you do with that? And uh, and if you do the wrong thing, then they tell whoever, and it comes back to me a different way. So there's a lot of that that happens in the credit in this role as a CEO. It's just very different. Um, when you're not, you're sort of insulated from that. Um, when you're in the role, you're not. So you're very exposed. I had to get comfortable with knowing that there will be people that don't like me in the company. And that that's okay. Um, there's if 90, 99% of people follow me, believe in me, well, that's good. You're never going to get 100%. But initially, that was hard for me. The first time I got criticized, it, I took it hard. I was like, oh, Am I in the right job? Am I, am I, am I the right person? Um, and then you start realizing, you know what? I was here for a reason. I was put in the job for a reason. I believe in what I'm doing. This is the route we're going to take. We're not going to deviate. Whether people like it or not, this is what's going to take us to the next level. And, and it's my job to make sure that we see it through, regardless of what people say. So that's the hard part. That's the non-fun part. But I will tell you, if you ever have an opportunity, it is fun. It's fun. I enjoy my job. I love going to work. Uh, I love watching people excel at what they do. And, and knowing that maybe I had a small, small role in helping them get into that position to excel. So that's the cool part. Yeah, awesome. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have requesting some advice. As a people pleaser myself, <laughs> <laughs> and in a leader in the hot seat, there's a lot of other student leaders here as well. What advice would you have for me? As a people pleaser, mm -hmm. you have to be comfortable with being very uncomfortable mm -hmm. because no matter what you do, there's always going to be people that don't like you or don't you don't get along with. And that's okay. Right? You, can't, you can't please everyone. I, I'm not necessarily a people pleaser, but I, that was very important to me. Maybe to be liked. And uh, you quickly realize that you rather be respected than liked. You like you want both. Trust me, you want both. But the respect is important because you want, if you're leading an organization, you want them to believe in your following, right? Um, because you can't do anything by yourself. Absolutely, <clears throat> you need your team. And if your team doesn't believe in you, if your alignment don't block for you, you're not winning championships, right? So you need them to believe in you and respect you. So I think that's important. Um, the people pleasing part, I mean, that's important. Relationships are probably the biggest thing. So you establish relationships, you have people you trust, um, but you can't please everyone. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, if you were to, uh, maybe I shouldn't talk about politics, but you talk about any po politician, right? There's always going to be people that love them and hate them, always two sides. Doesn't matter what level of government. So they have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because they what? They're voted in by the public. And so they, you naturally want to be a people pleaser because you want them to vote for you. With anything you'd be voted on, but you can't, right? That's just hard. Mm -hmm. So if you can get comfortable with that, then I think you'll be fine. You can yeah. still be a people pleaser. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to say like, as a people pleaser, I tend to overcommit. And I know you have a pretty busy schedule. So how do you manage to be a CEO, a husband, a family man, volunteering in the community and Iolani head coach? You know, um, it's, so this kind of is a bad cliche, but it goes back to really time management, right? You can't do, I mean, if you want to do a lot, it's, it's about how do, you, how do you put your schedule together? What, what's important? Um, I coach football, I coach intermediate football at Iolani. Six days a week, so Monday through Friday plus Saturday is probably a game or something in practice. I probably miss, since I've been in this role, last year was the first full year in this role. I probably miss two practices a week. And so I had to meet with my coach and let him know this is gonna happen. Um, so I have to prioritize, right? I have to prioritize what I, I can and can't do. Um, I have super good family support. My wife is amazing. Um, she works at Kaiser, she's a nurse. She's got a busy schedule herself. Um, but like today, she's picking up my daughter from the two daughters from school. Um, 
And, and, I, and so she, she'll take care of that. And then I think one of them is at volleyball tonight. My father dropped me off my younger one to ballet. She does ballet. Um, and so I th I'll pick her up at like seven tonight. Or I don't know if she has late. So it's about prioritizing time management, knowing what you can or can't do, not overcommitting to everything, not saying yes to everything. Um, I have had to say no to things that I would have loved to done, have done, but um, you just got to make sure that you you take care of yourself as well. Right? You can't, you want to do so much. And I mean, I, I so you may sit on boards, any, any boards today? So I get asked to sit on boards quite often. Uh, I think I sit on four boards right now. Um, I was asked to join the American Cancer Society and by another CEO of another credit union uh, from Big Island. She's the president of the board. And I couldn't do it. I can't, I can't, I would love to have said yes, because that's very important to me. Um, but I was already committed to four other ones. So I asked Katie Mobley, one of our, our chief growth officers, she could uh, take that spot. And she was very happy to do it. So she got onto the American Cancer Society board. But there's always opportunity. So I, I try to not overcommit because um, when you are doing something, you want to do it right and do it well. And if you overcommit, you don't. So I'd rather give 100% to four boards than 50% to eight boards. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks for the free advice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I would say we kind of danced around your leadership style, but what exactly is it? You know, people ask me this all the time. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> so I went to another leadership forum and uh, Hawaii Business News, I think. And so somebody goes, I'm a servant leader, right? They said, I'm a servant leader. The other person said what they said. And the third person, and I'll I mention it because I, I was blown away by his answer. Uh, he's the Scott Sue, he's the new HEI. See you. He said, my leadership, the whole room, he said, my leadership style is beef stew. <laughs> Everybody's like, what did you just say? And he said, because it's, it changes, right? There's all different things. It, it, it's a mix. And I, I thought his answer was awesome because I always sit here thinking, what is my leadership style? And, and I can't answer that because it changes. It depends on the situation I'm in. Um, I like to think a lot of times I lead by example, meaning um, the chairs, right? We moved the chairs. At work, we had to do something. We, had, we were, uh, one of our branches got broken into. They, they broke the window on a Saturday. Uh, no, on a Sunday, on a Sunday. And uh, I got a call saying, hey, one of our branches got broken into. Our head of facilities was there. Our head of branch, branches was there. Branch manager was there. <clears throat> so I drove down. I live in Manoa, drove to Waipahu. Um, on a Sunday, drove down there. And uh, and I and we're sweeping flats and I grabbed the broom and I started sweeping. They're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Go, we got this. I said, no, but I, I'm another hand. I'm another body that can help. And so I'm all for helping and getting rolling my sleeves and getting in there um, because I can't ask somebody to do something I wouldn't want to do, right? So if I'm asking them to do it and they're managers, they're leaders, I, am I too good to do it? Absolutely not. So I got there and, and I, so I hope that's one of the many styles. So to answer your question, there's probably a lot of things depending on the situation. Um, but yeah, that's a weak answer to your question. Sorry. No, it's but okay. It changes okay. depending on the situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I also change in situations as well. Like you need to act a certain way, like yeah. when I'm talking to you today or the way I act with my friends. Why but, you don't act like this? Uh, I do, but <laughs> a little more relaxed. Uh, I'd slouch more in the chair. <laughs> yeah, but I guess... I think you have some idea about leadership because I saw that you have some certifications on your LinkedIn. Do you mind explaining? Which was like, I think it was the Six, uh, six Sigma. Yeah, Six Sigma. Uh, so Six Sigma is an interesting certification. I have, a, I have a black belt at Six Sigma. Um, there's different levels, green belt, yellow belt, black belt. Um, the black belt, so it's, it's, it's all about process improvement. It's about efficiency. It actually was rooted in uh, manufacturing. So when you manufacture uh, a cell phone, right? It comes off the assembly line and they measure and they look at defects. They look at within how many millimeters is the defect um, and so forth, right? Because not every single shell of a cell phone is gonna look the same. It's like, but you, human eye won't tell, but they can measure that. So it's all about measuring defects, throughput, and cycle time. How long does it take to do something? How many can you do? And how many errors do you make? And so I did take that certification 
the black belt, the difference is it, it focuses on the statistics part of it. So you use statistics to see it, was this statistically significant or not, the change I made. So if you improve something and you measure it, how do you know if it's a good change or not? So we use statistics to determine that. So that's what black belt, that's the black belt side of it. Prior to that, the yellow and green is more about the improvement itself, mm -hmm. how to do it. It's very applicable for, for banking, believe it or not. Um, everything we do is a process, right? You come in, you deposit your check, it's a process. What happens in the background? You use your phone, you make a remote deposit. Um, there's something that happens in the background. <clears throat> Every check doesn't go through automatically. Some get rejected, there's a defect. We can't, just, we can't read it. Uh, maybe it's not signed. Maybe there's something missing on the check. So that's a defect. So now how do we take that process and improve it so that more can go through and less defects happen? Because every defect takes a human to look at it. What happened? Why did it, why was there an error? So Six Sigma is very applicable for banking, not just manufacturing. Okay, great. Um, so would you say for students, do you think getting a certification would be helpful for like entry level jobs? Yeah, um, certifications are, are really good. There's so many out there, but it's it's good. Um, Six Sigma is good. Uh, I, I will admit that when I graduated Shiler in 2007, with my MBA, I thought I was on top of the world. I uh, I signed up for CFA, you guys know what CFA exam is? Anybody signed up for it or wanna do it? It's, it's probably the number one financial certification there is, the hardest. Um, Chartered Financial Analyst, CFA. Um, it's a three-year, it's three tests over three years. I would think, I think that the average takes like six to seven years on average to get it. Nobody passes all three exams in a row. Well, not nobody, but very, very, very few. Um, it is the highest certification for finance. I had my kid in you know, 05 when I started my MBA. I graduated 07. My wife was pregnant with my second kid and she got she born, was born in 2008. So I signed up and I was like, my wife's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I won't take it. But I got the books, so that's good. Um, maybe one day I'll, I'll take that CFA certification. It's very Wall Street. You work on Wall Street, they all have it. Um, it's, it's a very important financial certification. But there's a lot. So if you have opportunities to take a certification, yeah, go for it. It's not gonna hurt. Um, they might differentiate you from another candidate. So those are good things to have. Another tool for your toolbox. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, thank you. All right. So this next question: How many of you are entrepreneurs in here, or in entrepreneurship club? Show of hands. One. Yeah. There's yeah. Don't be shy. I know. I know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this next question is. What do entrepreneurs need to know about building a banking relationship? Oh, ha. You, oh, man. Not Silicon so Valley Bank, huh? You gotta uh, bring that up. <laughs> That's a great case study. You guys know all about that, right? Yeah, you guys are probably studying that right now. Um, okay, so about building a banking relationship. So the hard part is banks are, are not going to typically bank entrepreneurs because it's a startup. Uh, there's banks like history, right? It doesn't matter if you're a credit union or a bank, we like history. So it's going to be very hard to bank. That's why Silicon Valley Bank was so important to Silicon Valley because they banked entrepreneurs um, and startups. In fact, do you guys mind talking about that a bit? Yeah, go for it. I mean, that's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's in the public eye. So so Silicon Valley Bank banks startups, right? And, and unfortunate that they went out of business because it's a very niche market to know and learn and understand. And there's a lot of risk with startups, right? Um, and that's why traditional banks or credit unions don't bank them in, in general. So if you do want to establish a relationship, uh, you may, as, as an entrepreneur, say I'm, I'm starting one company, I may have to personally guarantee something, right? I might have to put my actual name on the line and say, if that loan goes bad, I'll guarantee it. If you're starting a company, you actually don't want that, right? You want the company to be able to get the loan. That way, that, that's why you create an LLC or, or S Corp or C Corp, right? To protect yourself from liability. Um, but 
in the event that you're doing a startup, you may have to do that. Um, you know what, before we talk SV, SVB, um, I will tell you something interesting. So my so my twin, I have a twin brother, identical twin brother. He's also a Shiler and Bob grad. Um, he's an entrepreneur. So maybe you should be talking to him. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so he's the president of Premier Dental Group. And what's interesting is he knows nothing about the industry. Talk about entrepreneur, entrepreneur right? He's, he's in the dental industry. And so what happened was he was working for a company in HR, and then he went into a dental company and he learned a lot while he was working there. And he became their head operations guy. And he realized, hey, look, dentist, the mom and pop shop. Anybody's a parent and dentist here? Yeah, so so your, your dad or your mom that is a dentist, um, they have an office, they probably do very well. But if they buy a chair, the chair might cost $5,000. Right. These maybe even more extras are super expensive, like ten thousand dollars. So my brother's sitting there going, Oh, can we imagine if we bought different chairs in one? We can get a better deal. But what what dentists can buy 50 chairs? Right? They can't. He's like, okay, what if we did insurance, medical insurance for the employees? They're usually about five to seven employees in the in the dental office. They have to pay high premium for medical uh, medical insurance. He's like, what if we create an association so that everything falls under this association and that we get give lower, lower um, premiums to our employees of all these jobs? So he started thinking about this and he ended up leave, leaving that company, being a dentist, and they started their this corporate dentistry, they call it. So they bought a, they bought an office and the, you have to be a dentist to own a dentist's office. My brother's not a dentist, so he can't. So he partnered with his dentist. The dentist owns part of it. My brother owns a management company, right? And so he manages it, manages it. And the idea is you have to get more offices because the more you get, the cheaper it comes for everyone. And so he was trying and it was really hard. So he went out to an investor, pitched to a few investors. He got uh, seed money from a local investor. So he got $7 million and he bought a whole bunch of offices. So now he has 12. And what happens is, Everything he buys now for his 12 offices, it's cheaper, right? So now he can operate at a more efficient clip than each individual office could by themselves. And then he centralized the management. Anytime you go there, you have insurance, dental insurance. The dental insurance, he's, they do all the claims within their office, the back office, centralized. So dentists, why they sell to them is because if, they, if they're, so do you have any siblings that are dentists or anybody? Yeah. So this is very common. Dad or mom is a dentist. They don't want to take over the company. So what happens is the dad says, hey, when I retire, the mom says, hey, when I retire, I'm done. Right? What they don't realize is there's a lot of value in that, in their patient base. So my brother will say, hey, you want to retire in two years or three years? Yeah. Well, you know what? Rather than walking away from it all, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your company worth $500,000. i will buy for $500,000. The dentist was like, what? I would never have thought I could sell it for that. But you have to work for three years. You have to work for me for three years. And all you do is the dentistry and go home. I take care of the leases, I'll take care of their medical insurance, I take care of their employment, everything. You just do work and go on. And then they're like, this is fantastic. I'll do that all day long. And then what he does is he brings a young dentist in. So when that person decides to eventually retire on their own time, the new dentist can take over because they've been working here for two or three years. So very entrepreneurial, my brother. So that you should be talking to him. Um, next time, next time. Yeah. So now <laughs> he banks with banks and, and, uh, and us as well, um, because he's got revenue and he's got two or three years of established history. Um, he got it because he had that seed money that helped him build his business, right? With that seed money comes restrictions, right? He, he had to give up a lot of uh, equity for that. So you guys know about the entrepreneurs. If you, if you take an investment, um, you will give up something. Know that there's only 100% of equity. So you can't give that all the way, all the way if not, you're gonna, can't do that for anything. So he had to give equity away, um, but but that's the trade-off for getting the investment money. Now he's bankable because he's got three, four years. He's got financials that look really good. They're positive. Their break-even was to be like five years. They broke even in year two. So they're, they've been doing very well. Um, and so and now any bank in Hawaii will bank. Um, but if you're not there yet, so first thing, personal guarantee would be something you might think about. Um, I would caution against that only because that's your personal liability now. 
The other way is there are SBA loans. SBA loans are um, small business administration. They will bank startups. You will go to a bank or credit union like us to do an SBA loan. The reason why we do it through SBA is because SBA will guarantee half of it. So we reduce our risk by 50% and then we would like to do a loan. So SBA loans are very important to startups. Um, not everybody can have a Silicon Valley Bank. So this talks to the Pond Valley Bank. <clears throat> so everybody follow that? Everybody know what's going on? Pretty crazy, huh? Do you guys know in 2019, they were like 60 billion in assets? And by 2023, they were over 200. That's like amazing growth. Amazing. That's like bank will growing four times in four times the size in, in three, four years. This doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. And the reason why they grew so fast was because VCs were giving startups money in the millions and they're depositing it in Silicon Valley. So the VCs money was just being transferred from one place to Silicon Valley in the millions. So it just kept growing. Prior to maybe, you know, there was a period of time where there was a lot of investment money out there, then it slowed down. Well, it just started picking up about five years ago. It started picking up. That's why SVP grew so fast. Problem why I bring that up is they grew so fast that what do you do with all that money? You're getting all this deposit money, you have to do something with it. If you don't invest it right, it just sits there. It doesn't earn anything. And then you're rated at the size of corporation or company you are, but you're not meeting your, your performance standards because that money is not working for you. But you can't deploy it fast enough because it came in too quickly. So they went and they went on and bought bonds, which Every bank and every credit union in this world will buy bonds. We can only invest in like top graded, rated, Moody's rated bonds because we're investing your money. If you're investing your money, you don't want us to go risky and go invest in something that's high risk. So the federal government says you can only invest in very secure, safe bonds. But they did. But the difference is duration. So duration risk. And what I mean by that is, what was the, everybody know what the rate was in 2018, 19? Just a 10-year bond rate? Come on, you guys are business rate, finance, like, what is the, what is the bond rate about three, four years ago? 10-year bond, what was it? I'm HR, so any finance majors? Nobody finance? Who's finance? Okay, 1%. 1%, right? So you could go out and get invest that money in 1%. Is that a good return? No. Terrible, but that's what bonds were going for. <clears throat> so what happened was they went out and they said, okay, if we go a little longer, not five years, we go 30 years or 10, 15 years, we can get one and a half, right? So even if you go 15 years, the average duration by five, but say uh, six years, but say you say you went out longer so you could get a bigger yield because the longer the money, the higher the yield, or the yield curve, right? So they went out long. Okay, this is the problem. <clears throat> What happens to a bond price or value when rates go up? What? No, the rates go up. <laughs> yes. So, okay, so think about it this way. But good, that's good. So when when you're one percent, you buy it. Okay, so you buy a hundred dollars at one percent. Okay. Now rates move on us, which they did right in the last 2022. It moves super fast. So now it goes up to four percent. Is your hundred dollar bond at one percent? Good anymore? No, because I can buy a hundred dollar bond for four percent today. So if I sell my hundred dollar bond, what do I have to sell it for? For anybody to want to buy it, I got to sell it for less than hundred dollars, right? So when rates go up, bond values go down. This is the inverse relationship. So SVP invested all his money long at one percent, one and a quarter, one and a half. Rates moved three hundred percent, three hundred basis points in three months. So now you can go out and get the same bond at four or four and a half, right? In 2022. So now they have this huge loss on their books because it's called unrealized losses, right? They have a hundred billion dollars in bonds, hundred billion, probably more, at one and a half percent because they have to get a return on the money that they got so quickly. So, the, but the breach went up on them super fast. So now the hundred million, hundred billion is worth. Two billion less, actually more than two billion. It was worth. There was a probably. It was probably worth ten billion less than what else? What would they? So if they sold it, they would lose ten billion dollars. 
If you never sell that $100 bond, 1%, at the end of the term of it, you get $100 back. You get your interest of 1%. So you don't lose anything. But if you sell it early, you lose money. Well, guess what? SVP had to sell theirs early. So they had to sell 20, they sold $22 billion in investments overnight to fund money leaving the company. They lost $2 billion. That's a huge loss, right? That's probably their whole earnings for the year. And it hits their income statement. So then they have to go out and disrupt their capital. So they went to get money, they issued stock. By then, everybody was talking about them. It took them two days to issue stock. By the time the stock got issued, Whoever gave them $2 billion to buy their stock lost their $2 billion in a week, not even a week, in four days. They gave them $2 billion, they issued the stock. The very day that they got issued, that stock dropped 60%. And they had a run on the bank and they went out of business. All because of this embedded, unrealized loss that normally is benign, that doesn't matter because it just pays off and it goes away. But because people are taking out money, in chunks of money that they had to sell their investments because that's how they weren't, they didn't have the cash. So they had to sell it. Remember, they took the cash in quickly. They redeployed it in bonds. People that pulled it was stuck in bonds. So they had to sell it at a loss and they had to sell it. And so that's what took them out. I mean, there's a bunch of things, but that's just the gist of what happened. Uh, we have that same problem at the credit union. We have an unrealized loss on our books. The difference is, as a credit union, so you guys know what? What is the FDIC insurance? You guys know? Up to what? 250,000 per account. We have NCUA, same thing as FDIC, federal government insurance. Our NCUA is 250,000, same thing. SVB, they had 90% of their deposits not insured, meaning people had over 250. 90% of all their accounts were over 250. So they were insured. We're opposite. We're completely flipped. We're 90% insured. So all our members, our customers, their their accounts are insured. Um, Ten percent may be exposed, but very little. So highly unlikely that a bank or a credit union in Hawaii will get to have a run, because if, why would you be worried? You're you're hundred percent insured. Um, second of all, SUV their top depositor had three point three billion. Think about it. You're insured for two hundred fifty million, two hundred fifty thousand. They have three point three billion. That guy took his money out, right? The second biggest one, one of the second biggest ones, Roku, he has no Roku. Roku had five, almost 500 million. Guess what? That was an insured of only 250. So when these guys are together, money is chunks, right? Credit union, it take, we have 130,000, 133,000, 132,000 members. 100,000 members would have to take out their money for us to be concerned, right? SVB, it took a couple hundred big ones to be concerned. It's a very different environment. Just put a super cool case study for you guys, learning about what's going on, how to avoid this. Bank of Hawaii, First Hawaiian, us, we all have this unrealized loss sitting on our data sheet, all of us. There's not one bank in the country that's not exposed to that um, or credit union. And so it's very interesting. You. You worry, talk about your, about your CEO job, what you do. Um, a year ago, when rates moved on us, we had a huge unrealized loss on our books. It scared the crap out of me. I was like, man, what is this? What are we gonna do? How do we protect ourselves? Not even thinking that SUV could happen. But I was still worried, I was like, what is this? What do we do with this? Mm -hmm. So I told my board, hey, look, we have this huge loss on our books. They're like, okay, what does it mean? I said, nothing, unless, Everybody takes their money out at once, but that's never going to happen. And uh, and it, it bothers me. It's just sits there, and I'm always worried about this kind of stuff. Most people don't even know we have that on our books. And so I got to sit there and I worry about it. And then SVB, SVB happens on a Friday. So what do I do? What do you think I have to do on a Friday? So Saturday, what did I do? I had to send a message out to our membership on our website saying we're safe. Right? Just to, you know, calm some fears down. Um, but that's the kind of thing that impacts us. Something in Silicon Valley impacts the future of Hawaii. You guys know Bank of Hawaii stock? Anybody have Bank of Hawaii stock? Nobody? Oh, you guys are finance guys. We're students. We're students. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Bank of Hawaii stock trades between $75 to $80. Yeah, come in. So. 
$75, SUV fails on Friday. Monday, the stock market opens. Geico stock drops is $37. $37. They lost half their value over on that day um, because of fears, unwarranted fear. People sold. Geico stock has since rebounded to 50 something. So today it goes at $52. Um, good buying opportunity and money. Yeah. Buy at 37, you're already in the money at 50, it's probably a 70 dollars stock. Um, but look, that's how Banco got impacted all the way from you know, from Silicon Valley. Banco has nothing to do with it. Right? I we had impacted, we don't have stock, so we had to send out letters and messages that one. So they did uh, Hawaii Bankers Association. So a very interesting case study that's with you. That you guys would be like all about that because it's a good case study. Anyway, so, yeah, no, no, no. It was an interesting story about. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Um, we are a little bit over on time. Sorry, I'm always going over. <laughs> but, but, but I do want to have you get a chance to do a few closing remarks, one to two sentences on what advice do you have for the next generation of leaders? What advice? Or students. Yeah. Um, uh, I would say, I would say to be bold, take risks. Don't take crazy risk, calculate risk, but be bold. Change the world, seriously. Disrupt. Um, I'm trying to do that in the credit union space. I'm trying to disrupt voice credit union space. Um, unfortunately, I can't take crazy risk because I'm dealing with actual people's money. And you will think uh, one day, whether whatever you it doesn't matter if you you know work for tech company, you're still dealing with people's money, investor money, stockholders' money. Um, but be, be bold. I mean, don't be afraid. To, to do what's always been done. Change it up. Um, we're, we're, we're gonna do a branch, we're gonna open a branch uh, that has no cash in it. That has no safety deposit boxes. All your traditional banking stuff is out. Uh, we're opening in Kakako. Uh, we just signed a lease. We're going into a demographic that is different. We're, we're not doing traditional. Uh, we hired a tech company to help us, believe it or not, help build the branch out. An architect for the thing, but a, a tech company because we want to put tech in there. So we're going to try to disrupt this space as much as we can um, for the better, make it easier for everyone. So that's my advice, is, is make UH make proud and go out there and change the world, really, and then do something cool, because um, you can. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Should I do this home? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, real quick, we're going to have five minutes, lightning questions, Q&A. If anyone has any questions right now, now would be the time to do it. Yes. Hi, I'm Seth. And my question for you is, so there's a lot of reasons people leave or stay within the company. What made you specifically stay? So I stayed at ASB for 12 years. <clears throat> so long as I stayed somewhere, but um, typically it's about four or five years, but eight years ago. What made me stay was, so talk about taking risks. I, I, I didn't do one thing i did a whole bunch of stuff so when i was at ASB, I started in project management and i did all kind of projects that i knew nothing about i did all kind of projects and then i went into credit risk i did credits for a while and then i went into what they're going to after that was it marketing no six sigma was my process improvement so it's process improvement then i went to marketing um what made me stay there was that i had all these opportunities and, and a lot of people don't take it they're always presented but they don't take it because they're afraid to, to start all over again. Because every time I left, I started all over again. When I left project management, which I knew well, I went into credit risk, I knew nothing about. Why not nothing? I knew something, but not much. I had to learn it. And so I kept having to almost reinvent myself along the way, um, but that kept me there. Some people will go into one area like, okay, I'm gonna be a commercial banking officer and do that for the whole life, the whole career. And that's a valid path as well. But for me, what was interesting was I kept it, they kept me interested by different opportunities throughout the organization. So that was important. Um, I loved their CEO at the time, Rich Wacker. He was, he was amazing. Uh, I think something was named after him here in China. Uh, he's an amazing CEO. So he also kept me there. All right. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? You and I. Okay, Deborah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned bringing on like new technologies or adopting new technologies. What are some of the um, obstacles that you that your um, company has run into 
when implementing these new technologies, right? So a lot of it is infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Our network architecture is not necessarily built for this kind of, bless you, <laughs> for this kind of stuff. Uh, we're doing Salesforce right now. So when I joined, we implement, we're implementing Salesforce right now. Um, it's tough because a lot of what we had today wasn't built for Salesforce. So that's the biggest obstacle is trying to bring a new technology with old technology. Now, a lot of times we get rid of old technology, but we can't get rid of it until the new one's on. So that's a lot of obstacle. The, how does it fit into our network? Can it fit? Um, what's the security like? So that's kind of obstacles we look at. We're looking at some cool things, a new branch. We joke, but we, we're looking at um, facial recognition when you walk in, right? So when you walk up to somebody, they already know who you are. And we're not even gonna have tellers. It's gonna be machines. Um, so we're looking at cool things. We don't know what we're going to end up doing, but um, we might not be able to do that kind of cool thing. Maybe just traditional looking things, but we'll try. Ooh, awesome. Okay, Chris, I want to say thank you so much for your time coming out to talk to all of us. Of I'm just wondering, was there any part of your worldview, whether it be your values or that things that changed once you became CEO? No, what was interesting was um, I always thought I was a, hopefully everybody thinks this, that they're, they're you know, high character, a lot of integrity. Um, I've always thought that about myself, but man, when I got this job, that had to be front and center. Sincerity had to be front and center. Trust had to be front and center. All the values that you think that you possess that are important to you, um, you might take for granted and it's just there. But when I got into this role, because it's visible, those things came out like to the front. Um, Stacy is not gonna trust me if, if I'm not a trustworthy guy. Stacy works for for you. So that was important. That that it didn't change, but it became more obvious. It became more in your face that this is important, and that I was have to almost lead that way, so people know who I am, uh, because. Uh, it's all about trust, I think. A lot of it is about trust and integrity. So that was interesting. Yeah. Again, it's always there, just now it's front and center. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, this concludes the QA. Please give a warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs>